David and Ruth Laskin. Which one do you want to be? Uh, I prefer to be Ruth, but I'm flexible. What do you think? Uh, uh, alcohol. Oh, boy. So, are you okay with wine? Uh, I don't know. Well, you choose the wine. I'm gonna go find a bedroom and slip into something more. Ruth. I'm ruthless at the moment. I really should go. I gotta catch my ride. So go. I did. I thought maybe you were a nut. But you were excited. I wish you'd stay. I wish I'd stayed too. Now I wish I'd stayed. I wish I'd done a lot of things. I wish I had... I wish I'd stayed. I do. Well, I came back downstairs and you were gone. I walked out. I walked out the door. Why? I don't know. I felt like a scared little kid. I was like... It was above my head. I don't know. You were scared? Yeah. I thought you knew that about me. I ran back to the bonfires, trying to outrun my humiliation, I think. Was it something I said? Yeah. You said so go. There's such disdain, you know? Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Jolie? What if you stayed this time? I walked out the door. There's no memory left. Come back and make up a goodbye at least. Let's pretend we had one. Rebecca Martin and I'm the organizer of the Chicago Film Lover Exchange. Today we're going to be talking about Michelle Gondry's Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which came out in 2004, screenplay written by the great Charlie Kaufman. Uh, we will be uh, splitting up uh, this discussion in three parts, and for this part uh, we will be discussing uh, Gondry and Kaufman's collaboration on screen. Now, I'm interested to hear what you guys think, especially after that clip we just watched. Yeah, that clip was a, re a really great example of what is um, remarkable about both uh, Kaufman and um, Gondry. Like, they're both really, to me, they're both really inspired in two totally different ways. And I think the fact that it was a house that collapses is a really cool example of it because... Kaufman is all about putting up a structure and making this real big edifice that 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 can that all that the characters can inhabit. And Gondry, on the other hand, is is so more interested in like breaking things apart and seeing what like yeah. the, seeing what things could result from it. And you get to see like examples of both like the anarchic anarchy kind of thing and the structure kind of thing at work in that particular clip. I mean, right, and now. Uh, Sorry, go ahead, Brad. What the clip uh, really hit home for me is just how uh, real mm -hmm. the relationships and the characterizations yeah. are of the two characters. Mm -hmm. And while at the same time the, this is such a believable, relatable love story, mm -hmm. it's also, there's these fantastic things happening throughout the entire movie, these right. uh, science fiction elements that are just you know, held subtly at bay but intrude on this very realistic story. Yeah. And I think that summarizes the relationship of uh, Charlie Kaufman and Michelle Gondry and, and how they, re they act together mm -hmm. in that, that Kaufman provides this, this relatable base and, but also this fantastic, fantastic element is allowed to come in realistically, which Gondry's low-tech special effects right, uh, right. executes perfectly. Yeah, for sure, definitely. Um, uh, well, I wanted to say two things specifically. The, the first thing is that um, it, it, it's 
it's obvious that Charlie Kaufman has a very specific style. It's, it's identifiable. There's a sense of the absurd. There's a sense of psychological aspects going on. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's interesting that Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind is the only Kaufman film that I'm aware of where um, he has a co-writing credit, and that's with Michelle Gondry. So I think their collaboration is inherent in the, um, yeah. in, in the finished product. And the second thing I wanted to say is that that clip is like a perfect microcosm of the film because one of the things that's so amazing and sophisticated about Kaufman's script is that there are so many multiple things going on at the same time. In that one clip, there's voiceover, there's a memory that's taking place in the past, but we're also in the present inside the memory, and both Clementine and Joel are commenting on it, right. and also mm -hmm. hearing it, and also remembering it, mm -hmm. but interacting with it. It's incredible, and it, it, it happens so smoothly, which is thanks to Gondry, mm -hmm. that we follow everything that's going on. We know where we are, in the conscious and unconsciousness, mm -hmm. even if we're not a hundred percent sure, and the, the the changes and flips are almost immediate, but we follow what's going on, and we know that he's inside the memory, but that they're changing it, mm -hmm. and that kind of sophisticated multiple levels is one of the things that I love so much about the right. film. Right, and Shannon, what were your thoughts about the collaboration? Um, I was going to say that I really agree with the lo-fi things because. Um, it's kind of the same thing. It's a kind of, kind of a dream logic where um, it doesn't make all of sense in your dreams, but there are crazy mm -hmm. things going on. And we see that in that clip we just saw because there's you know roof falling down, there's water right. coming in. Literally, your memory is washed away, literally and figuratively. And um, I also like what you said just now about you know how um, the subconscious and the subconscious are, are mending together. So we see. Right. Um, kind of what's really happening in the very beginning. They're talking, Clementine's getting alcohol, and um, you know, like our main character is being freaked out. Um, but then at the same time, he starts to talk, talking to himself, and then um, and then Clementine kind of steps in as right. this other part of his consciousness, mm -hmm. just like filling yeah. in the gaps. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, I did that. Oh, was that crazy? You know, like that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you have that kind of internal conversation all the time, but the way that um, I think Gondry shows Clementine as a step in, right. it's like a, you know like an interweaving of the reality, but at the same time, we as viewers know it's mm -hmm. the sub subconscious he's talking. Yeah, and there's um, a, a, another scene in another part of the movie where that exact point is underlined. Um, Joel is in an earlier memory where he's in um, the offices of Lacuna and uh, Dr. Mirzwiak is saying, um, how can I help you, Joel? I'm in your head too. I'm a part of your memory. Um, so I think that that's right, an excellent right. point to be making. Yeah. And also, I, it reminded me of this uh, scene where um, I think it was, oh yeah, Joel saw the Elijah Elijah Wood character, uh -huh. the, uh, the new yeah, Patrick. Yeah. Patrick, yes, the new boyfriend, uh -huh. and in the bookstore. So he didn't see who he was. It was blocked by this mm -hmm. kind of box on the on the counter. Mm -hmm. And um, later on, he kind of realizes in this dream subconsciousness world that it might be Patrick, and he pulls this guy over in his memory, let's say, mm -hmm. but there's no face. There's right. Just, you know, like yes. A right. Weird, weirdo right. eyes. Right, yeah. right, right. That, yeah, that's in another scene. Like, His eyes are upside right. down. It's like yes. forcing out your memories. You know, like, if, right. who is that guy? He might be this guy. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure, but it shows very, in a visceral way, mm -hmm. this is how your mind works. You're trying to parse it out, but you don't know who it is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Gondry shows that in a very literal sense where you see a blank face. What I love about the film, among many things, is, mm -hmm. is that, that every prop, every costume, every piece that is identifiable is used at some other point mm -hmm. and, and referenced, sometimes referenced in a very unique and interesting way. For example, um, when Joel is in his memory of being a little boy and being bullied to hurt that bird, right, right. Mm -hmm. um, the, there's a group of like four little kids that are making fun of him. Mm -hmm. And one kid has a pasta colander on his head yes. that looks exactly like the dome mm -hmm. that they're putting on Joel to oh, zap his memories. Yes. So it's, it's like this 
oblique reference showing you that Joel's memory is like inserting this object into this this part. Mm -hmm. And uh, so like all of these things are happening at the same time. And I think that's the way that memory works. And that's what, one of the many things I, I love about this right. film. Mm -hmm. and, and something interesting is uh, I feel like Gondry's perfect for like a dream logic memory type story, mm -hmm. uh, especially with all the creative visuals and materials that, mm -hmm. like you were saying, um, like things were being reused. Yeah. And then what I think makes it great is Kaufman, his dialogue. It just is core. Like, yeah. It's emotional core. And with that in all this crazy visual madness, you just feel at home with it because for some reason you just really identify with this with everything and we'll get that into that in the next part but i just i think that's the beauty of the collaboration and the magic we see on screen mm -hmm. so al do you have the collaboration is really great because i think that kaufman gets to the the head of what dreams are like he he sees how like like as you said, Shannon, like the particular details that people remember, like or and the things that people didn't get to witness, uh, the things that are focused on their attention are the th are the things that they carry with them and they base their decision, the decisions and their actions off of. Um, uh, but but Gondry on the uh, on the other hand is the the pure dream inspiration, the idea, the spirit of Clementine can almost live in through God, what Gondry can do on how you can just take a take a moment and just run with it and spin it and give it a level of of, of inspiration that be impulsive exactly yeah. that that's that lets you that 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 lets you go feel through the world uh, wow. instead of just yeah. like looking back and just analyzing what it what it what it is. Gond um, Kaufman helps Gondry's Gondry's amazing inspired ideas make sense. He gives them a structure. Right. We have a writer who is as much of, of an auteur for a film as the director. This is not mm -hmm. generally the case, mm -hmm. but if you look at uh, being John Malkovich and adaptation in Synecdoche, New York, you see this kind of uh, and themes that uh, are in common with Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Um, Kaufman brings a uh, certain neuroticness uh, to the to the piece too, as 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 you you said, uh, probably personified uh, by uh, Joel. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very cool. One thing that I I noticed this last time that I watched it is how. Uh, amazingly well constructed the screenplay is. They yeah. give you clues from the very beginning that um, this procedure that Lacuna provides is an imperfect science at best. Mm -hmm. The very first time that Joel goes in and is sitting in the waiting room, uh, Kirsten Dunst's character, Mary, is on the phone with a customer and she's saying, no, I'm sorry, you can't have the procedure done for the third time in one month. Mm -hmm. You're going to have yeah, to wait. So yeah. there's already yeah. this sort of mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind of, you know, um, put together with duct tape kind of yeah. uh, right. aspect to the science. And, you know, it, it's, it's obvious that Mark Ruffalo's character, mm -hmm. for being a computer technician of a certain caliber, is pretty much a chucklehead, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then Elijah Wood is a, Patrick is a, you know, a whole, you can make a whole movie <laughs> yeah. about Patrick. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm interested, uh, Shannon, is there another scene that you think really shows, like, the magic of collaboration? Let's see. I really like kind of the backward narratives of it. Mm -hmm. um, in the sense that we first see Joe kind of wakes up really miserable, has a dent in his car, he has no idea how he got there. Um, and you get the sense that this guy's lost, that something might be wrong. There's a like a, you know, very nostalgic music playing in the background. Um, he has a sudden urge to go, you know, like take off and work. Yeah. Right. Um, but you don't know what's, you know, going on yet. Right. And then you see this kind of, you know, boy meets girl kind of situation. Um, it's going in well, you know, they're going back home, but then suddenly, you don't know what's going on, like they don't know each other anymore. So um, I think that's what the script brings. It's like, you know, that backward narrative. Um, 
but what Gondry brings into it is kind of, you know, this embedded kind of anxiety you feel as you go and watch a kind of a very, the beginning of a very, you know, simplified, very um, mm -hmm. conventional love story, but it's not because you have all these little things in between the music, the, um, you know, the mysteries um, that's embedded. Yeah, and then very soon after that is this is another uh, scene where I think like the Kaufman and Godfrey work really nice is when uh, like he's uh, Joel's looking back on the on the imagery of the different mementos he had to give away in Lacuna, and one of those is is a is a drawing that he did of when they were in a Chinese restaurant, and he laments about we don't want to be that couple who the were dying dead. The, the, the dining the dead, dining exactly. dead, the dining dead, dead exactly, dying dead. exactly, Sorry. and then and then they and then. Joel looks past her, and right there is the book, and uh, right there is the bookstore. Mm -hmm. and, like the world of the bookstore is that, uh, the world of the bookstore is already inhabiting the same world where Joel's mind is, mm -hmm. and it's depicted in just a completely natural, organic way. Mm -hmm. Something in a way that like lets us completely relate to uh, uh, relate to it, like on an instinctual level. And uh, Gondry's so good at doing that, and like I I like how he does it with by just showing attention. He does a spotlight. When a, when a memory is fading, he has like a fl literally a flashlight focus or move move yeah. around to show that people's perspective and the Im and the images they're trying to they're keeping in their head are fading or being very limited. Right. And also he's um, he he's dramatizing the fact that these uh, technicians are zapping his memories. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that the memories are fading; it's like something foreign is. Pulling them out right. of his breast, right. and 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 I think that's illustrated really well. What in, in you know the house crumbling in that shot we saw, and in uh, the books disappearing that you were pointing out, Brad, and, and other aspects as well. And Gondry brings this very childlike uh, element to his uh, filmmaking. I mean that in the in the best of ways. There's an there's an innocence there to uh, how he views filmmaking mm -hmm. as kind of doing magic tricks. Mm, and so, so yeah. you know, you mentioned blurring earlier, mm -hmm. and it, it, when he does blur, he doesn't do it through uh, the camera work that uh, most filmmakers do, d does. He he actually has a uh, translucent glass that he would place in front of or behind the actors mm -hmm. huh, to blur right. the background, and there's this sense of play uh, that that Gondry brings to all this that I think uh, makes this. Uh, one of the most visually exciting films uh, right. in recent years. Definitely. And uh, with that, I'm going to um, close this part one down. Um, but I think what we should do is say one word we feel, um, just one word that kind of describes this collaboration. Like I would say magic. Gondrakoftastic. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon. I want to say visceral. It's very, you can touch it. You can feel the memory. Mm. Okay. I'd say film because this is one that brings together all elements that we would want film to embody. Right. Um, I would say collaboration because uh, they each bring their own unique elements to make the film better than their uh, individual efforts, I right. think. Right, definitely. Mm, agreed. Okay, well great. That's the end of part one, and I'll see you for part two. Thanks for watching. Thank you.